Well, first of all, I think everybody in this room is foodies. Yes, raise your oh hand if you're foodies. Yes. <laughs> and uh, when I was saying, like, I honestly will get up so early to stand in line for your food. <laughs> so having you here sitting in this chair is particularly well, thanks, exciting thanks. to me. Yeah. Um, Toro Bravo invented the 445 dinner <laughs> you know, kind of thing. It's so, right. it's so good. I that don't I, know how many times I've eaten there, and I don't think I've ever looked at the menu. I know. It's just like start bringing me food it'll be fantastic it's almost like when you eat like a blue hair person much older person you can actually get into your restaurants which yeah. is fantastic isn't it <laughs> well that that are really late That's, yeah yeah, yeah really exactly yeah. Really late. yeah yeah and Gorham is how you pronounce it right yep, yep. Uh, so John Gorham who is I think probably one of the most successful restaurateurs not just in Portland but in the region at large and um, the reason that we're talking today is not right. about food, although I hope Thank to you. get to the connection of healthy food and healthy minds. But because you are doing so much in terms of trying to raise ar awareness around mental health, so thank you first Thanks. of all for that. What what raised your awareness about the need to understand mental health and talk about it? Uh, my, my my upbringing. My my mother battled depression my whole life, and you know it 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 led into drug abuse. You know prescription drugs. At her time, and you know, she, you know, slowly over a decade killed herself. Oh, geez, oh, I've had the same experience of losing someone to suicide. So I'm so sorry. It's yeah. a very, it's it's uh, one of the experiences that you probably can't explain to someone else unless you've actually been a family member to someone who dies by suicide. Yeah, you know, our my experience was a little different because it wasn't overnight, one day here and next day not. I mean, right. it, was, it was a slow death. Yeah. So when you started working in the restaurant industry, you went to work around the same time as Anthony Bourdain and all these people where it's like sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, stress all night, party all afterward. What has changed recently in the restaurant industry because of this new awareness about people really, really burning out? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot more chefs and owners taking notice of that. Um you know, I, I early I saw the destruction of it. You know, you saw someone who come in the kitchen that was talented and good, and you know, lifestyle would hit them and they'd fall apart. And you know, I when I became a restaurant owner, I, I I you know I made some statements that I wanted to be different, and I still had my learning lessons to do. We we still played too hard in the beginning and pushed ourselves a little too hard, but you know, it's it's every person has the ability to grow and learn and. I think that's something really important to self-reflect and, and see how you can be the change. I want to bring the doctors in because anytime I hear somebody say something, I was like, oh, that's like <laughs> what these guys are always telling us. <laughs> everyone has the opportunity to grow and learn. Yeah. Talk about how important that is, Jenna. Yeah, everybody, everybody does. But the other thing that you're saying, John, that I think is so important about that is everybody has the opportunity to grow and learn if you create the right context for it, and I think that that's what you're doing and other people like you, uh, is setting the context, setting a particular culture or expectation in, in the kitchen or in your restaurant that is going to be one about health and sustainability rather than let's burn burn hard kind of thing. And so when you give people that context and sort of an expectation of, hey, I want to support you in living well, people can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, one of the things that I've noticed organizationally is if the very top is doing it, People who are coming in are much more likely to try to identify with that than if, like, an immediate supervisor is. And the way I always think about it is anybody who has any goals at all wants to aspire to be you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're watching you, John. Do you ever feel the pressure of that? I do. You know, and I, I talked to my management team about that, too. I was like, we—I we, we I had, a, I had an experience in my um, early 20s to go work in a casino in uh, West Africa. And— um, and, and, you know, the, the coupier who trained me to do, I did roulette and blackjack, um, you know, he was like, we're selling an image, you know, and that, that became very aware of that young. It was like, you know, we had to sell an image of what the guests wanted to aspire to. And I think about that in our restaurants all the time, um, selling our image to our employees. Not everyone can be in the inner circle of, of the culture we have, but 
we want people to aspire to get there, so that makes them work hard and want to rise up through, through you know through the ranks. Brian, mm-hmm. when you uh, think about changing a culture, like ch- like he is, you know, individually attempting to kind of change an entire culture, a way of being. What are some of the most helpful steps that a person can take in terms of being a leader in this if they wanted to change the culture around how people talk about mental health, how they actually work in the workplace, and what they do when they need help? I think cult- I think uh, modeling and conversing as opposed to preaching yeah. uh, or setting boundaries like we're not going to do this or we are going to do that. It, actually, earlier on you were talking about you know, people play a little hard and then they're not able to fulfill these dreams. They're not able to kind of advance their agenda. To me, highlighting the agenda, highlighting the thing that you're after um, is is sort of the it's like the mark on the compass. Hmm. Like, you know, this is the direction we're going. We're traveling westward and things that allow us we can do these other things so long as we're continuing to move west. If some of these choices that we're making move us in an opposite direction, they're not bad and wrong. That's just not what we're trying to be about. Yeah. Right. So it seems to me like modeling and also just conversing that this is really important to us and we're making something here. We're not just getting food out tonight. Yeah. And and I love that, Brian, and that piece of focusing on what you are wanting from your employees and your staff. Um, versus what you don't want. I mean, so often we focus on the, like, don't do this, don't do that, don't Mm -hmm. screw up in this way, versus we want you to excel in this way and that way and whatever, and helping support them move in that direction. And then the things that are going to get in the way of that are sort of going to kind of fall by the wayside a little bit easier. Yeah. John, how do you handle if someone, you've said, we're open about mental health issues, I, I want to talk with you about your depression or anxiety. How do you respond if someone comes to you with this kind of issue? Well, what I've done is I've built up a support team on the outside. So I have a, um, I have two coaches that I like. Um, and it's kind of funny going into what you were saying about knowing where you're going. That mm-hmm. was something that I had. You know, I opened up about five restaurants, and I was like, where am I driving this thing? Mm-hmm. I, I was like, yeah. mm-hmm. I have this creative, you know, need to, to express myself. And we had a lot of success and, and capabilities of con- uh, continual expanding, but I didn't know where we were going. And so I, I built my support team. I have a life coach, and I have a corporate coach. So and so smart. when someone's having a hard time, and I and I can see that, I'll send them to one of my coaches, uh, depending on what their hard time is. If it's personal in nature, I send them to my personal coach. And if it's business in nature, I send them to my business coach. And in my business coach, often I sit in, we'll sit in and we'll, and we'll talk to them together and try to guide them into a healthy place. Wow. It's so cool. I'm, I can't, you know, it's so rare to talk to somebody who's at the very top of a corporation that's as tuned in to the cost benefit of doing what you're doing. You know, there's all these numbers bandied about, like for every dollar you invest, there's four dollars return because the person shows up ready to work. They're actually happy. How do you put a value on what it is that you're offering for your people to actually deal with their mental health? Well, I mean, I think that my 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 employees are the most important. You know, I, I, don't even, I even hate saying employees. My team yeah. is my most mm-hmm. valuable asset in life. And you know, I, I, I recognized that very early. I started the four-day work week, you know, when I started Toro Bravo and stuck with that. Um, my salary employees, I, I have a system where, like, if you ever had to work a six-day, I pay you. Wow. So I say, I only buy five days. I don't want your whole life. I want you to go home, be cut off, you know. And then I offer, you know, on top of their, P, you know, we, we, we staggered into, like, a European PTO situation where salaried chefs get three weeks off a year. But they also get a three-day weekend quarterly on top of that. And so we're, we're saying don't burn out. Go, go take care of yourself. And our turnovers are low, and that really, you know, helps, um, you know, one, keep my culture because the people that are there understand it. And two, you know, they, it helps, you know, lure new people in. And, yeah, they don't sound like employees, and they hardly sound like team. They almost sound like family. Yeah, yeah they, no they are. No, uh-huh. they're very much family. And when they know that you have their back, then they're like, we're going to show up for John. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and even that piece when you were talking about having them, you know, encouraging them to go to your personal coach or your business coach, even just that piece of the person at the very, very top acknowledging I have I have a coach or I have a therapist or I have yeah. a whatever acknowledging that you're this human being that benefits from these resources too. Like so often I see organizations doing things that are well, if you're struggling and if right. you need some help, here are the resources for all you lowly people who might need some help. Yeah. And that's a very different place than saying, hey, I have a great therapist or I have a great coach or I have a great whatever. Why don't you go talk to that person? Yeah, no kidding. You know, I know you recently went through a whole big process with uh, telling your employees that you had a, a needed brain surgery, preparing the entire culture for that change, your wife taking a bunch of the of the responsibility. How did working with your mental health and knowing the things you needed to do to keep yourself healthy, how did that prepare you and sustain you while you were going through the physical part of what you had to endure? Well, I mean, I, you know, I... I thought about that a lot and how I would handle it with other staff members because with the amount of people we have, it's, you know, the odds I'm going to deal with this with other folks. And I really thought, you know, I'm like, I'm going to, I, I was like, I told my team, I'm like, I got to go deal with this. I, yeah. I got to take the time off. Mm -hmm. I'll be here, but I might not always mentally be here right, right. now. And, uh, you know, I'm going to give you, I set up a board and I said, if I, if I can't help you in this time, then this board will. So and, um, you know, I kept the board going strong and we still have it, but I, you know, it's kind of assembled a little bit because I'm there, but, uh, you know, I, I let everyone know that here's this team of 12 people that have been with me eight years plus that, know, that know me intimately that are going to guide you while I can't. And what was the process for you to stay positive and motivated and to really go into a very, very complete recovery yourself? Um, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm a survivor, you mm -hmm. know, and that's just my, my upbringing. Yeah. And, um, I'm also restless. And so <laughs> I can't, even in recovery, I can't sit still. Uh huh. So, uh, I think that's just a natural drive I have to get back out. Yeah. Mm. It seems like you're doing really well today. I'm, I'm doing really good right now. Yeah. You look great. Yeah. So we were trying to figure out, I had heard you have nine restaurants now, but I couldn't find all of them in all of my research. So can you name them off the top of your head? This is like giving somebody the alphabet test quick. Yeah. We have, uh, <laughs> uh, Toro Bravo, right. uh, Tasty and Daughters, Tasty and Alder. Mediterranean Exploration Company. We have uh, two Shalom Y'alls. Okay. Where are those? Uh, one is uh, right across the street from Tasty and Alder on okay. 12th and Alder. Yeah. And the other one is in the same building as Plaza del Toro, which oh, is okay. the next one I was going to name. Got it. And then we have uh, two Bless Your Hearts. Wow. At, at, with this much responsibility, so much indoctrination into managing people now, do you ever feel like, okay, I'm just going to pull back and, and watch the party that I've created? Or are you so restless that you continue to go like, no, I can do more. I can do more. Um, a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, I um, I mean, you know, I, one, one battle I have in my own mind after my brain surgery, I went into a really deep, dark place. And, um, you know, I've, I've come out of that and, and I'm really being, you know, taking note of like how much of a blessing it is each day. But the reality of the situation is with a stage two glioma, my chances of a reoccurrence are really high. Mm. And, you know, it's probably going to take me out a little younger than my original first plans of life. So now I'm thinking more about I don't you know, I don't see retirement as probably in my future. So now I'm starting to think about um taking some big blocks of time off with my family each year. So mm -hmm. smart. Jenna was telling me about this amazing idea last week when we were talking, yeah. um, how many people have decided to start thinking differently about their lives. And instead of retiring and then taking blocks off, taking blocks off blocks at a time while you're young and can enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. You're doing that, right? We are doing that. My partner and I are doing that kind of this idea that rather than, you know, Working your whole life until you're whatever, 65, and then getting those 10 years to hopefully be able to travel the world or do whatever you want to do, being able to take 
for us, you know, one year every several years and just take that as a little mini retirement or a, we call it a sabbatical and going away. We did our first one last year, actually. Um, and so it's sort of that idea of you have some clues that kind of tell you maybe I'm not, you know, who knows, yeah, but yeah. M- maybe you're not, who knows. But um, and so that kind of inspires you to say, I'm going to live fully right now. But actually, all of us, none of us know, right? And so what if we all lived our life as if, how could I live as fully and meaningfully as possible right now? And maybe that means taking some time off, even as you're being as successful as you are and saying, and I also want to spend big chunks of time with my family. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. There, when you look at the statistics for the restaurant industry, it's still really scary. It's got the highest uh, use of substance abuse, the highest use of illicit drugs, and um, the suicide rate is second highest. Uh, so I'm just thinking, I know you're one guy, but are you talking to a lot of other restaurateurs who are starting to cope with this as well? A little bit. You know, I, I definitely, I have a I have a support group of other restaurateurs that I, you know, like to run things off of and talk about. And I know... You know, I know there's some some guys out there that are really trying to to be the difference, and mm-hmm. especially in Portland. The mm-hmm. sober kitchen movement is something that I heard about uh, with Gregory uh, at Departure. Is it Departure? He's at yeah. Um, does it work? Because alcohol is such a part of the party culture, which is such a part of the young people who come to kitchens. I, I you know the sober movement's been healthy. I think. Um, a lot of a lot of people are skipping over the balance, you know. It's like go out there and be crazy until you can't anymore, and then get sober. Right. I mean, I think about what if we could teach these kids balance, and they never have to go sober. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I I preach that a lot in my in my group. Yeah, that's super yeah. smart. Yeah. And um, because you have this kind of people look at you as both a very talented chef and a very talented business person. Do you have a mentoring program for the for the younger people in your organization who say, I want to be this kind of leader when I have my own kitchen? Um, you know, the, I would say that's more about being in the inner circle. Yeah. You know, and the inner circle is pretty big. You know, it was, you know, I think it was about five years ago I met with another coach and he was like, how many people have direct access to you? And I was like, everybody. Wow. And he's <laughs> like, you can't sustain that very long. Yeah. So, you know, that's when the inner circle really got, you know, built in and, you know, so you know the managers. You know what I what we what I just started doing there on on that topic is every Friday at the end of my day I write a newsletter to the management team, and it's like you know it might have an issue that I see coming up or some culture problem. You know, I might I might throw out some like books to read or a movie to watch or something like that in that letter. So but, um, smart, John. So I'm, I'm hoping that that trickles down to everybody else. Yeah, that's so great. Um, I know a lot of people who worked with Anthony Bourdain said, you know, a, a lot of us who knew him and knew his demons and knew his struggles were not as, at all surprised by his suicide. But calls to the suicide hotline went up by 360 percent after he died for almost a week. And so I'm like, are these all young people working in these kitchens really struggling with the thoughts that they might also harm themselves? Or are they just wanting to know what to do to get better? I mean, the, the Anthony suicide was so, like, brutal on, a, on our industry because this is the guy who had it all. Mm-hmm. This is the guy who worked his way up to the very top and everyone admired. But if life wasn't good enough for him, mm-hmm. then how is it going to be good enough for people that don't think that they have those skills to get to that high? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, you know, that brings up a point. For me, when you were talking about you know, naming off the number of restaurants that you had, I think sometimes people might hear that and think like, "When is enough enough? Like, what do you need? Like, twelve of them?" Or, you know, but I don't think it's that. I don't think it's about arriving at a place or achieving something. It's more this is just you expressing the stuff that you care about most. About you know, you were talking about like, well, I don't like sitting still, and I'm creative, and I want to express it. And if I live into creativity and expression and being active, I will probably end up with a number of these. Hmm. But it's really just about living into those values that you have than it is achieving something. Um, In the same way, people can chase an achievement and not be attached to their values. You can just sort of be... uh, 
pursuing a goal thinking if I have this, if I have that, if I just have nine restaurants or if I just have this or just have that, then I'll be okay. And the way that you do things reflects that it's like, this is the stuff I care about, whether I had one of these or I had a hundred of them. Hmm. Well, and I think that's related to what you were saying, John, about the um, Anthony Bourdain kind of tragedy and people's response to that is what we do is kind of we hold up this guy that he he actually had absolutely everything that I was going for and that didn't save him from the suffering that life gives us and so what I see in that example is maybe this idea of if I can just achieve, if I can just get these things, then I will be okay. Maybe maybe that's the wrong game to play versus mm-hmm. I think what you're talking about now is this, how do I achieve the things that are important to me and live well? And maybe it's the living well part that's going to help you with those those demons, those sufferings that life gives us all. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. I often think, you know, you're such a big kind of like imposing figure. Like people, we don't have a camera here, but you're six two and really like one of those guys. I'm sure that for many people, they're like, I can't believe this guy just talked to me about how am I really doing and wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Is it is it funny? I mean, if you had those experiences where employees are like, what? You know, definitely. You know, I, I, one of the things I believe is, is you usually nine times out of 10, if a, an employee, especially someone who's been with me for a while, starts having issues at work, the first thing I ask is, is how are you doing? Yeah. I'm worried about you before right. work. You know, I know that something's bringing you down. So what do we got to do to get you back up? Yeah. It's beautiful, nice. John. If if um, if the three of us come in, which restaurant should we go to? Because we're, our next oh. celebration together is something we're <laughs> we've been putting off for some time. I mean, Toro Bravo is always magic. You know, that's that's my baby. Oh, nice. Squidding yeah. pasta with yeah. anchovy <laughs> syrup, best dish in America. I, I think I think Mediterranean Exploration Company has as much magic going on. You know, mm-hmm. Alder has got a special love for everybody, but it's yeah. it's a, it's crazy in there. So it's it's <laughs> you got to pick the right time for that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jenna was saying, you know, I I love the way that she simplifies mental health and that if everyone could move every day, if everyone did some sort of exercise or something that made them be out in the world, if you have someone you can really talk to and tell your troubles to and your secrets to. And also, if you take a little time for mindfulness every day and just live in this world more mindfully or meditate, you do all three of those things now? Pretty much, you know, like like I, I. you know, growing up with my mother being so depressed, I, 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 I heard all the tools and all the things she was supposed to do. And I, um, you know, I, I, like, again, after my, my surgery, I, I mean, I went dark. It was, I, I've never, you know, I thought mm-hmm. I knew what, you know, I've had the blues before that, mm-hmm. but that was straight depression. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just never gave into it. I just was like, you're going to get up, you're going to make your bed, you're going to take a shower, you're going to get the hell out of the house. Right. You're going to, you know, you're going to mm-hmm. do your things. You're going to see people. Um, if someone asks how I'm doing, I'm going to be honest. And I, I'm going to walk every day and get some exercise. And, and then I'm going to, you know, try, try to think positive when I can. It's interesting how those little wins build oh. to recovery. Well, I, some, right? I sometimes yeah. tell people, you know, it, it seems as though emotions love themselves. Like whatever you're feeling, the thing you most tend to want to do maintains that emotion. If you're afraid of something, you avoid it. Well, the more you avoid something, the more you're afraid of it. When we're sad or we're down or we're depressed, you shut down, you withdraw, you isolate, you don't get up, take a shower, put on clean clothes. Well, if you wanted to like get somebody sad, just prescribe, stay in bed, don't answer your phone, don't take a shower, yeah, don't right. put on clean clothes, no. and you feel crappy. It's like just act opposite the emotion. It's a little bit different than faking it till you make it because faking is like I'm not feeling sad. Right. I'm actually fine. And then you've got this grin that hides the pain. Yeah. It's more like I am down and I'm going to do the next reasonable thing. I'm still going to show up and I'm still going to participate. Yeah. And never underestimate the love of a human being, yeah. right? That's your good. wife, your partner, yeah. your lover, your best friend. You yeah. know, I, um, I, I did this seminar and um, it, it's on the, I think it's the three principles seminar thing. And it's, it's, it's mindfulness all the way. And the whole thing and that mindfulness is, I, it's funny. I ended up, my wife wanted me to go and I went 
about two months before my diagnosis with brain tumor. Wow. And the whole basis of these three principles are is that your thoughts are just made up. Mm-hmm. It's all made up. Big and, stories. And so, yeah, exactly. So not believing your own story sometimes <laughs> is important. Yeah, and when you're depressed, the story is, I can't get out of bed. I can't do this. I can't go on. And so being able to have those thoughts occurring to you, but not having those thoughts dictating to you of right. how you're going to live your life, that's kind of the key, right? And that is mindfulness. It's about being able to be aware of what your mind is doing. You know? It's so funny how people will take a few minutes and have a mindfulness practice or they'll go for a walk for a half an hour or they'll go have coffee with a friend and then they tell themselves, all right, well, that was nice. But back, <laughs> but back to the real world. Back as, to my depression. As though the stuff in my <laughs> right. head is yeah. the real world? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's been so nice to spend some time with you, John. And I'm really, really proud of you being a business leader in our community and in the restaurant industry nationwide and just saying, here's how we can change things. We really can save people's lives. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks, for really making, thanks for making your team your family, and thanks for all the really good food. Oh, yeah. Good job. Yeah.